With a really good understanding of objects and what they are in JavaScript from previous lessons that we have, we also need to understand that the JavaScript API provides us with several objects that we can use and those objects provide both attributes that describe that object as well as functions or methods that allow us to operate on the data that is held by that object. We're going to go through four very specific objects in JavaScript that we get globally. In other words, we can always access them no matter where we are in our script because they are provided by the JavaScript API. They are functionality that is provided to us by the developers of the JavaScript language and provide that base functionality that we use across all applications and we don't have to write that functionality ourselves. We're going to go through the string, the number, the math, and the date objects and kind of look at what these objects are, how they work, and then maybe go through a couple of functions that they provide us for operating on those data types. These are very specific to data and manipulating that data, and that data is in different forms. So we'll start out with the string. Up until now, in all of our JavaScript, we have run into both strings and numbers frequently, and most of the time we have seen them in their literal form. So what I mean by that is, we have seen examples of strings like this. Let my name equal Tim. And we are literally creating a string right here. It is in quotes, which tells JavaScript that we are creating a string. And within those quotes, we have a series of characters, and those characters go in a very specific order to create a very specific word. And so really, a string is an array of characters that are in a very specific order. And this string right here, to us, really is just a string. It's just an array of characters in a specific order. It's not until this string is actually put into the string object and it is wrapped by a string object in JavaScript that this data of Tim actually becomes useful to us in our application. And what happens is that when we create this string literal, behind the scenes, when JavaScript puts this into our memory, inside of our bucket, and then we have a reference to it with this name, JavaScript automatically wraps this string literal in what we call a string object. And once we have a string object that we can reference using this variable, we actually have the ability to do things to this value that is held inside of the this, this string object. In other words, once it is wrapped in the string object, this becomes the string value that that object holds inside of it. So we can kind of think of it something like this. We've got the value, and it be, it's Tim like this. And then we have some functions or methods that we can actually perform on this value inside of this object that is a string. And this is all happening behind the scenes. So let's take a look really close at the string API that is provided to us by the JavaScript documentation. If you go to the developer.mozilla.org, so the developer network provided by Mozilla, we get a really good reference to our JavaScript API. And in this, we can do a search for string using the search bar right here. And once you get to the string documentation, we can look at the methods or the abilities that this string object has to operate on the strings that we have or have created. And with this, we can look at some of these methods and understand what they do for us and how we might use them. So let's go ahead and let's pick one that we can use to do something. So let's look at substring. So substring. Method returns the part of a string between the start and end indices or to the end of the string. So here, if we look at the usage of it, we can define a string, we can call the substring method on it, and we can provide the indexes that we want to pull out specific characters out of our string. So let's give that a shot in our code here. And if, if we continue with our example here, if we're looking at this mock string object, if we're going to use this substring method right here, 
if we look at the object definition, it would be something like this. And then we have a function right here that takes in an indices. So we do index one and index two. And then in here, we pull that data out, right? We would do something like that. But that's just for example or just for demonstration's sake. So now that we know that this is an actual object, it has a value property that holds the array of characters. And we know that the API provides us a substring function. We can actually use this to pull information out of our string. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and do Tim Clark. And if we look at this, if we turn this into an array or we think of it as an array of characters, we've got one, two, three, four, if we count the space, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's try again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we've got nine characters inside of our array, which means we have eight indexes if we're thinking about arrays, which we'll learn about in our next module. I can actually use substring, that substring method on the string object and I can pull out information out of my string that I want. So maybe I just want the first name in this name. So I could say let first name equals and then I can say my name dot substring. We're going to use that method right there. And I want to pull out the first name and looking at that string, it starts at index zero and ends at index three or two. No, at index three, because we're pulling out one, two, three, so zero, one, two. So it's going to be index two. And then let's go ahead and do a console dot log and let's go ahead and pull out the first name that we pulled out of that string and let's go ahead and see what we get. Oh, we got TI, so that's zero, one, two. So let's go back and read this. Maybe we're doing it wrong, okay? So it says we're gonna pull out a string between the start and end indexes or the end of a string. So here we're saying let's start at index one. So if this is zero, this is one, and then let's pull out all the way to index three, but it looks like it's not inclusive, it's exclusive. So let's go ahead and look at this. In other words, it goes from index one, which is the O, and goes to index three, but it doesn't include index three. So it's exclusive of the last index. So let's go ahead and go back to our Visual Studio code, which looks like it crashed on us. Go back to Visual Studio code. And let's say that if we're starting at index zero, which would be this one, and we want to pull the full 10, that means we need to go to index three in order to pull out that entire string. So let's go ahead and try that again. And here, we've got Tim. So it pulled out the first three characters of this string as a substring, starting at index zero, which is the first index, when we think about an array, which we'll learn about later on. And then we go three spaces, and that provides us with that substring. So inside of our API for the string, we can see that we actually have a lot of methods that allow us to manipulate or work with strings in various different ways. And it would be a good idea to go through the string API and learn about all of the methods that we have available to us to work with strings. This way, when we are manipulating strings in our applications, we don't have to try to come up with a new function to manipulate a string that already exists because we'll know what we have, like to lower or to uppercase. I'm sure these could be extremely valuable because most of the time we're gonna get strings from users or we're gonna be pulling them from databases and maybe to make them more human readable or more presentable in our web application inside of the HTML, we're gonna to wanna to do a two lower or a two upper on that string in order to make sure that it has the right case. So that's strings for us. Now let's talk about numbers. Let my num equal, and we're gonna do the number 10. Just like strings, this number 10 is a 
number literal. It is literally the number 10, and a number is simply a numeric character in an array, and they come in a specific order. Here we've got the number one followed by a number zero. We know that those two numbers in that specific order give us the number 10, which has a very specific value in our numerical system. Once this gets assigned to this variable and this 10 gets dumped in memory, JavaScript will automatically wrap this 10 literal, or this number 10 literal, it will wrap it in a number object. And once we have that number object, we are provided with the ability or more functions methods in that object class to give us special abilities to manipulate the value that's stored inside of the number. So if we go back to our example, we end up with an object that represents our number. That number has a value. It ends up being 10 because of the way we defined it. And then we're gonna receive a bunch of abilities or methods that we can use to operate on that number or, or different numbers. So let's jump to our number API in JavaScript. And let's go ahead and look at some of the functions we are given. We've got is nan. So we actually have something on the number object that allows us to, to determine if the value stored inside of this number object is actually a number or not. So it would look something like this, is nan, and then it would be a function that takes doesn't take anything in because we're working on the number value that's stored. And then in here, a check would happen to see if it's a number. And so this is of course just to exemplify that number, once this literal is actually stored and wrapped by the number object, this literal value is pulled into the value as a property of the number object. And then we have a bunch of methods that we can use to operate on that value. So let's go ahead and let's choose the is nan. So let's say console.log, just so we can see it in our console down there. Let's say my num dot is nan. And let's go ahead and call that function on it. And let's see what happens. We get an error. So my num dot is nan is not a function. So let's go back and look at this number has a method is nan so let's go ahead and click on that and see how we're supposed to use it so if we look at this we've got number is nan and this particular function on our number object doesn't actually operate on the value stored inside of the number object it's actually there for us to use on a particular number in fact you might actually remember when we talked about the is an global function that checks a number, we really get that from the number object. And the is nan function that we have globally is really just this function right here that we have available globally. So let's go ahead and change our code and let's go ahead and put in a different value here. Let's do 99 and we should see that we get, oh, because I'm calling it on my num where it is actually a number. This is a function that is on the number object, not on a wrapped object. So let's make sure we get that right. So here we get false. And that's because this really is a number. So if we ask the question, is it not a number? The answer is false because it is a number. So that is an example of a function that is provided by the number object, but it takes a value in and operates on that value. It actually doesn't operate on the value of a wrapped number. So let's see if we can find a function in our API that allows us to actually execute on something that is inside of our number or inside of our number object. So let's try this uh, to string. Let's look at to string. Here it says we can return the string value of a number that we have. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with that. So let's do console.log and let's do my num dot to string right here. Let's go ahead and call that function and let's see what happens. We got a 10. 
So really all it's doing is taking the value that is stored inside of our number object once the literal value is wrapped and this becomes the value. It's taking that number and then it is converting it to a string. So behind the scenes it's really just saying return and it's taking a string and adding the value to it. Oops, we don't want that. The value, so this dot value or something like that. Now, I'm just making this up so we can see how it works. It keeps updating that for us. Let's just do value. I don't want that. We'll do a semicolon. There we go. So behind the scenes, something like this is happening. And the, the value that's contained inside of this number object, which is this literal value 10, is then being added to a string, which makes it a string. So it would look like this as the output. And then this is then being printed to our console. Of course, I'm just making this up. This is not the actual way it works under the hood, but you might think of it as operating like that. So here with a number, we've seen an example of a function that lives on an object that's built into JavaScript that uses input to determine something. So this right here would be a method on this number that is a global function, which we've seen when we talked about global JavaScript functions. And then we've seen a function that can be used on the value that's held inside of a literal number that has been wrapped by the number object. And here we've been able to use the to string. And of course we've seen that this numbers object has some functions but not as many as strings. We definitely have more abilities provided to our string object than we do on our number object. Now the way you can tell the difference between a global function on a API object that is meant to take in input and do something to that input and then something that is actually a method of the object once it's wrapped around a literal is if you look in the API documentation you can see we've got a number dot is finite number dot is nan, number dot is integer, number dot is safe integer. All of these ones right here that don't have prototype in front of them, these are all going to be global functions on the number object and they are each going to take input. So they're going to expect us to pass in a number and they're going to do something to that number that is passed in and then provide us with whatever answer it's supposed to. Like this one, parse int, we've seen that as a global function. The parse float, <coughs> is safe integer and is nan. We've all seen that. They take in input. Now the difference here is, is that when you see dot prototype, what this means is that this particular function that follows dot prototype is actually a function that will operate on the value that is stored. So that literal value that is stored inside of this number object when the literal number gets actually wrapped by the number object. So anything that has prototype in front of it is going to be something that will act on the value that we store inside of the number object when it gets wrapped. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, you might need to go read about the prototype and calling methods on objects. Or make sure you talk to a faculty member, to your instructor, or to one of the tutors, and hopefully they can help explain it to you. If not, rewatch this video and see if you can't grasp the concept. Let's also look at the math. In the math object we're going to run into the same thing that we ran into on number. We're going to have global functions that are on that object that we can use by passing in information and then we are also going to have potentially um, functions that belong to the prototype or to the object that has a value that it's been wrapped around. We'll definitely see that in the date object, but let's go explore the math object really quick. And so the math object, let's pull that one up in our API reference. Here's our math object. Here we can see the math object has a lot of properties. And remember when we talked about objects, property is the data that makes that object unique or describes that object. We also have all of the methods. Now like we just talked about when we talked about number, we'll see that these functions are not on the prototype, which means they're not applied to a value that's stored in the object. Instead, 
These are functions that are provided by the object and will operate on some data passed in. And if we look at this, math.absolute, we're passing in the result of some subtraction between A and B. And so we're passing in data. And that's all of these ones. So the majority of the math functions, actually it looks like all of the math functions are going to be global on that object. In other words, they're all going to take some input and then it's going to perform some kind of operation on the input rather than a value stored in that object itself. So let's go ahead and see how that works. Let's go ahead and let's use absolute value. And we should all be used to that or familiar with it from math. And let's do let absolute value equal math dot absolute. Actually, it's just ABS, right? Let's look at that. ABS, and then we're going to pass in a value. So let's do a negative 500. And then let's go ahead and do a console.log on our absolute value. And let's go ahead and see what it, what it spits out. Right here, we'll see 500. Because the absolute value of a negative 500 is really just the positive value, which is 500. So here we can see that we are provided kind of this global function on the math object that allows us to operate on any number not a value that's stored in a wrapped math object. So math is really an API object that provides a lot of utility functions that we can use to operate on any kind of number or any kind of expression that we pass into the particular method. And each of these methods provides us something that we normally do in math, whether it be algebra, calculus, geometry, trigonometry, something like that. You'll see that we have these functions that do that, just like we would on a calculator. Right, so let's go ahead and look at the date object really quick. So we'll go ahead and close that one, close that one, and let's look at the date object. So this is the last one we're going to look at is the date object. Now the date object, it provides for us, let's make sure I'm in the right reference. I am not in the right reference. So let's go ahead and search date. Let's make sure we get to the right one, the date object. So JavaScript date object, and here we go, right here. JavaScript date object. As we can see with this example right here, it's going to create for us a date object, which we have right here. So we say new date, and then we're passing in a string that is in a specific format that represents a date. A lot of times you're going to receive a string like this inside of the body of an API call on objects that you have in that API call that have like a created date or a last updated date if it's coming from a database. And so those will be strings when they come in from the API call because everything is going to be a string when it gets translated into our JSON objects. We can take that string and as long as it's in a recognizable format that the date object can understand and we can learn about formats that it understands by reading the documentation, then it can successfully parse this date out of the string and actually create a date object for us. So let's do a console.log on this and let's see what date one has in it. And we should see this date right here, but we should see that it is now local to us here in Utah. So I am currently in Utah, which uses Mountain Standard Time. And it has been parsed in as Mountain Standard Time because I did not specify a different time zone. So it's gonna assume that this lives in my time zone. Now that we have that date and it is no longer a string, it is now actually a date object, we can use the date API specifically these prototype functions, which means these ones are going to operate on the value, this value once parsed, that is now stored in this date object wrapper, and we can actually get date, or we can get the day, or we can get the hours, we can get the minutes, and we can get the month. So let's go ahead. Right here we got December, so we should be able to get the month. So let's do a console.log, and let's do date1.getMonth. We'll execute that function. And let's see what we got. We got month 11. So that's kind of confusing because we know in our calendar, December is actually the 12th month of the year. Well, this is where 
JavaScript is a little funky compared to other programming languages. And that is because if we go look at the month documentation, we will see months are zero based, meaning that our months in JavaScript start at zero. So zero is actually January and 11 is December. So if we really wanted to make this readable to our average user, we would want to go ahead and add one to it in order to shift it by one. And so that's just, that's just the way JavaScript was implemented. So you just have to keep that in mind that months are zero based. And because they're zero based, it's zero through 11, not one through 12. So make sure you realize that when you are working with dates in JavaScript, if you want to get the right month number based on how we count months, you'll need to add one to the get month. Kind of funny, but that's the way they decided to implement it and that's the way it is. Another method we can do, another method we can do is the get date. And get date actually gives us the day of the month. You would think that it is this get day, but really what get day does is it gets us the day of the week. So we'll see that in a minute. Let's do get date. So console.log date one dot get date. Go ahead and execute that. And we will see that we get 17 back on this. So we got the month of 12 and we get our date of 17. Now you'll notice that the days of the month are not zero based, just the month is. So that's a little something you gotta get used to too, is it will count the days of the month correct. When you say get date, it'll give you back the 17th. It won't give you back the 16th because the first day of the month is really one. There's no zero, but our months are zero based. So a little weird, you'll just have to get used to it and, and realize that that's the way it works in JavaScript. So let's do get day and see what happens. Get day returns the day of the week. So let's go ahead and look at this. Console.log date one dot get day. We'll execute that function. And then let's see what we get. We get a zero. Now we would expect whatever day the 17th falls on, it's gonna be day one through seven, right? Cause there's seven days in the week. Well, this is where we also find out that days of the week is zero based. It starts at zero, where zero represents Sunday in the week. So zero represents Sunday. So if we get a zero right here, we know that December 17th fell on a Sunday back in 1995. And we also see that in our actual date object right here that got printed out. We see that it says Sunday, December 17th, 1995. So if we're gonna get the right day, if we're gonna do it based on how we usually count days, you might want a plus one to this, or when you're gonna change that number into an actual day, you might use a switch statement right here, pass in the value, and then know that zero is Sunday, one is Monday, something like that. All right. So those are some of the basic global objects that we get from the JavaScript API with a lot of extremely useful functions that allow us to operate on the value inside of the wrapped object. And those are any, any function that is preceded by prototype. And what prototype is is a little more advanced. We'll get to that later on. Just know that anything that is preceded by prototype is a function that will, that will operate on the value held inside of date. Whereas anything that does not or is not preceded by prototype is something that will take some input in order to create a date or else do something to validate a date or like we saw in numbers to validate a number. All right, so those are the primary objects or the basic objects that we use all the time in JavaScript that we are provided by JavaScript as well as functions and methods that are provided by those objects for us to use in our programming to solve problems that we might have. Make sure that you go back, look through the API, make sure you understand what functions are available to you so that you don't try to reinvent the wheel and that you use functions that are already provided, tested, and safe and secure.